<clears throat> Before I begin, it's a cold day and I want to uh, explain something. I was thinking that I was going to cover the 36 years that we've been praying out here, what that means in a khutbah. And that would take about an hour. And because of the weather today, uh, we cannot, I guess, hazard an hour in this cold weather. Therefore, I delayed that khutbah for a Jumu'ah when, inshallah, in the coming couple of weeks or so, the Jumu'ah would, the weather would be more favorable and we can express ourselves and our conscience on this because it's very important. So I thought I'd clear that before I begin my khutbah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah alladhi hadana lihadha. وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدان الله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله إذا قضى أمرا فإنما يقول له كن فيكون لا راد لأمره لا معقب لحكمه والله غالب على أمره ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون وأشهد أن سيدنا وهادينا ومرشدنا محمدا صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم عبده ورسوله من أطاع الرسول فقد أطاع الله وما أرسلناك عليهم حفيظا ما عليك هداهم ولكن الله يهدي من يشاء من يطع الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فلا مضل له ومن يعص الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فلا هادي له أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters, committed Muslims here and wherever you are. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبِّ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا The Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings, the Messenger of Allah says, peace and blessings be upon him, says, O oh my sustainer, my people have abandoned or deserted this Qur'an. I know what I'm about to say. Some people are going to misunderstand it as much as I in previous khutbahs tried to clarify it. As much as I'm trying to continue to make it very clear that Muslims, regardless of their schools of thought, Muslims are following uh, history books of fiqh and not following the Qur'an in their here and now. We are, we Muslims all over are inundated with what is normally called fiqhi opinions. And obviously I can't cover all the fiqhi opinions, I just have to take a sample. Some of these opinions you've probably heard from me before. But before I express what I'm saying, and if I remember, I will reiterate it after I express these fiqhi opinions. The Prophet's hadiths were not written or recorded during his lifetime. The Prophet's hadiths were not written and recorded during the time of 
the khulafa after him. We don't have a manuscript, the written papers or material in which Al-Bukhari or Muslim or Abu Hanifa or Al-Shafi'i or Malik or Ibn Hanbal wrote their fiqhi opinions and judgments about. They don't exist. The Quran exists from the beginning up until this time, until the end of time. But what the Prophet said, or what other individuals who are lesser than the Prophet said, the the manuscripts, the original writing of those individuals don't exist. This is a big issue. So what do we have? We do have books. And we have explanations and commentaries on those books. But we don't have the original copy. And that makes for, this is what you're going to hear. These are the opinions. These are the judgments of what we have in these books. Now, that doesn't mean, when you're going to hear what you're going to hear, that doesn't mean that a particular faqih said that. What it means is the information that we received about those particular faqihs attribute these sayings to them. And here is where governments and authorities and monarchies and dynasties play their role. They weren't absent from this. Okay. Some of these books, these history, fiqhi, jurisprudence books, they are textbooks in universities, in seminaries, in Islamic educational institutions. I don't want to name the books because once again, I don't want to name the fuqaha and I don't want to name the books in a khutbah simply because a khutbah is meant to stimulate the taqwa in you. It's not meant to have bad feelings. Anyone who's listening to this and comes out with some negative or some irritated bad feelings doesn't understand the khutbah and doesn't understand its intent and purpose. Okay, there's an opinion that says, you, I, you, I may have mentioned this before, but I'll, re- it, I'll mention it again. If a woman is married, now we know from the Qur'an, women and men are the same. Not the same in their physiology, not the same in their responsibilities, but they're the same in their equality. So this fiqhi opinion says... And it may be shared by other fuqaha. It says if a woman has her husband absent from her for two years, and he is presumed to have be, to have died or no longer returning, because he's absent, there's no communication. It's just she's now kal muallaka. She doesn't know whether she's married. She doesn't know whether she's divorced. And the Qur'an says, وَلَا تَذَرُوهَا كَالْمُعَلَّقَ Don't leave a wife in such state of suspension. She doesn't know what she is. So she marries. She gets married to another person. And she has multiple children from that other husband. And then years later, and she has multiple children, this I'm... I'm explaining to you a fiqhi opinion that has become religion to the Muslims in in contradiction to the equality and the fairness of the Qur'an. So after years, five, ten years, whatever, the husband, the first husband shows up. What what, What happens now? This is where our minds in the Qur'an should rule on this matter. According to this opinion, which I said, and I'll repeat, I'm not going to say which school of thought this comes from. 
because we're not here to impugn any school of thought. We are here to, crit- to be critical about information that does not sit well with Quranic thinking, with Quranic culture, with Quranic behavior. It says, if the first husband, the fiqh opinion says, if the first husband shows up, then that second marriage becomes invalid. And the children from that second marriage now belong to the husband from the first marriage. This, I mean, people are graduating with degrees with this in their head. Along these same lines, being that we're dealing with men and women, husband and husbands and wife, equality and fairness, another opinion says, if a wife becomes ill and sick and no longer satisfying to her husband, particularly in the sex sense of the word, then the husband is no longer responsible for caring for her. Does this opinion fit into your understanding of Allah and His Prophet? If she's ill, he he can't spend on her, he can't pay the doctor's bill, he can't pay for the medicine, he just neglects her. Is this Islamic? Is this Quranic? Is this prophetic? But it's there. And it's drilled into these minds that have given us the characters that we have around. I don't want to name anyone or any organization. And some books in this fiqh literature go even further. And they state the reason. They tell you why the husband can't spend on his wife. Because it says his wife was for his pleasure. So if she no longer can satisfy his pleasure, he no longer is responsible for her right. Or for her, the the word right doesn't, he's no longer responsible for her. This is how far we've gone astray from our Quranic values and standards. Also, a couple of schools of thought, I'm not going to mention them. If you come up to me privately, I'll tell you. But I'm not going to mention this in a khutbah. There's a couple of schools of thought, at least, that say, if a wife dies and she doesn't have the money to pay for her kafan, then the husband is not obligated to purchase his wife's own kafan. And if if you want to go further, this is what happens. We Muslims, we don't read. We we are supposed to be the ummah of Iqra. The first word that was revealed to us was Iqra. Read and understand. That's the first word. The first word wasn't pray, aqim as-salah. The first word was not jahid fi sabilillah. No. The first word was Iqra, and we don't read. If you read and you go further into these books, you will find one of these fiqh opinions says that it is permissible. Listen to this. I know it hurts. This hurts. I don't say this comfortably. One of these fiqh opinions says it is permissible for a husband to have sex with the corpse of his departed wife. It's called Mudaja'at al Wada'. The copulation of farewell. The farewell copulation. This is what we have. Is this Quranic? Is this Muhammadi? I ask you. We carry it in our institutions, in our books, all around the place. The Qur'an has honored women, women folk. 
The Prophet has honored women and women folk. The Prophet says in Hajjat al Wada, Anisa ushaqa iqurrijal, ma akramahunna illa kareem, wa ma ahanahunna illa laeek. Women are the counterparts of men, are the split parts of men. Only a person of honor honors them, and only a person of dishonor dishonors them. Okay, but there's another hadith. What does that other hadith say? Women are deficient in their brains, in their minds, and in their deen. How, how can you put this in the context of the Qur'an, of justice and fairness? And imagine, you know, the mistreatment and family problems and all of this, when this becomes religious guidance. What we are saying here, these fiqh opinions that are attributed to scholars, this is where the, our information is lacking. These governments, they played havoc with these fuqaha. They attributed these things to them. Because as I said, we don't have any information. We don't have the original copies of their opinions, what they said and what they wrote. We don't have that. We take the book of Al-Bukhari. I'm just taking one book. This is, you can say this about all other books of hadith. These books of hadith, has anyone ever read them? We read the Qur'an. We refer to the Qur'an. We have the Qur'an in our living rooms, in our studies, in our... We have it all over. And we read it. But these books of hadith, has anyone ever referred to them and gone back and see well, what's in this? They say this book is second to the Qur'an, right? Okay. And as I said, I'm not talking about one book. I'm just taking one book as an example. Al-Bukhari was born in the year 194 after the Hijrah. So when he began writing and investigating and researching and compiling the hadiths of the Prophet, it was well after 200 years of the Hijrah, well after that. And we have people who if you say there's something wrong in Al-Bukhari, they go wild. So what are you saying? If you if you wanted to take Al-Bukhari and read, you'll find in it, it says, Al-Mu'awwidhatayn, Qul a'udhu bi Rabb al-Falaq, and Qul a'udhu bi Rabb al-Nas are not from the Qur'an. The Bukhari will also tell you that the Prophet tried, he attempted suicide many times in Al-Bukhari. So I, re- I repeat once again so that no one thinks this is a khutbah that is assaulting Al-Bukhari or Muslim or Ibn Hanbal, Malik, Al-Shafi'i, Abu Hanifa. We think, Allahu A'lam, we think that the dynasties and the monarchies and the rulers, they were the ones who attributed or had these types of quote-unquote hadiths attributed to these fuqaha, these types of opinions attributed to the fuqaha, and these types of hadiths attributed to the Prophet. We have a long way to go to cleanse all of this that is producing for us what we have in today's world. There's another fiqh opinion that says it is permissible to have a newborn female baby in the cradle. It's permissible to allocate a husband for her when she is still in the cradle, when she's still months old or weeks old. Where did this come from? How did this happen? What type of perverts were monkeying around 
with the integrity and the high standards of the Quran and the Prophet to introduce opinions like this. And further, they says, whoever she is married to, obviously in most cases, probably the the parents or relatives who allocate a husband for her, says, according to this fiqhi opinion, the husband can have a sexual relationship with her when her body can tolerate, in today's language, the weight of the husband. Tragedy. We have tragedies in inside of us. This is, I'm not, we're not talking about something that is far away or far-fetched. Go to Fath al-Bari, li Sharh al-Bukhari, li Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, or others, and dig, read, see what's there, understand. An ayah in the Quran says, we want to compare the meanings of this ayah, which I'm going to quote. I'm going to compare the meanings of this ayah with the attitude of the Muslims, especially the ones that have the Saudi Arabian Wahhabi poison inside of them. لا ينهاكم الله عن الذين لم يقاتلوكم في الدين ولم يخرجوكم من دياركم أن تبروهم وتقصطوا إليهم إن الله يحب المقصطين. This ayah says, Allah does not forbid you concerning those who never fought against you because of your deen and never expelled you from your lands or your home countries, Allah does not forbid you from being respectful to them, from being courteous to them, and to be fair to them. أَن تَبَرُّوهُمْ وَتُقْصِطُوا إِلَيْهِمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُقْصِطِينَ Compare that attitude with what we have in today's world. They come to you and say, I was listening to this one Salafi major figure who says, we can't say our Christian brothers. We can't say that. It's a violation of the Qur'an to say our Christian brothers. And he uses an ayah. He says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً Meaning brotherhood is specific only to committed Muslims. So you can't say another human being is your brother. This is the, this is, and then they say you can't, if it's Christmas time comes, you can't tell a, you can't say to a Christian, Merry Christmas, or Happy New Year, or whatever the occasion may be. How is there going to be communication between us and them if there's not some some type of psychological bridge, they want to break, they want to destroy that psychological bridge, and then we wind up what? With the tragedies that we see. You've seen this in the past seven, eight years. The savagery, the bloodletting, the bloodshedding, the bloodbaths. You've seen it all. Where does it come from? It comes from those who are not steeped and grounded in Allah and His Prophet. That's where it comes from. And those who have all this money. Another ayah, the the ayah that I just mentioned, لَا يَنْهَاكُمُ اللَّهُ عَنِ الَّذِينَ لَمْ يُقَاتِلُوكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ It's ayah number 8 in Surah Al-Mumtahana. Ayah number 109 in Surah Al-Baqarah says, وَدَّ كَثِيرٌ مِّنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ لَوْ يَرُدُّونَكُمْ مِّنْ بَعْدِ إِيمَانِكُمْ كُفَّارًا حَسَدًا مِّنْ عِنْدِ أَنفُسِهِمْ Many of these people who have been vouchsafed scripture in times before you, the committed Muslims and Muslims, they would love to see you become deniers of Allah, His power and His authority. حَسَدًا مِّنْ عِنْدِ أَنفُسِهِمْ They're jealous. See, Allah went deep down inside of them and He tells us not only their behavior, but why they behave that way. حَسَدًا مِّنْ عِنْدِ أَنفُسِهِمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الْحَقِّ After they could see 
acknowledge, identify al-haqq. So what happens now? Of course, many of the Muslims, because of the type of information that circuit said, oh, I don't know, I, I've heard this ayah many times, but they didn't hear the, the last part of the ayah. Allah tells us, fa'fu wasfahu hatta yati Allahu bi amri. You pardon them until Allah finally decides in His own way this whole affair. We don't have this, not the behavior that we have around. Which, by the way, the Saudi government that has sponsored and financed that behavior right now is turning against the same individuals that they sponsored and financed. And all of this is happening on our own watch. It's not something we're reading in history. We've, we see this happen with our own eyes. وَقِيلِهِ يَا رَبِّ إِنَّ هَؤُلَاءِ قَوْمٌ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ And his statement, the prophets, these people are people who are not going to commit to you. What do you do here? Come and say, oh, these are enemies. Let's kill them. Let's fight them. Let's do this, that to the other. And the other two that disrespect them and, and, and burn their churches and kill them in the churches and do these other things that they are doing. The fanatic Saudi Wahhabi educated Muslims kill Christians in their churches. The fanatic, Zionist educated Jews kill Muslims in their mosques. The same result because of the same mentality. They just hide behind different rituals. And then we have in these books of fiqh what's called the Tibb al Nabawi, the prophetic, prophetic medicine. You find a couple of things in there, remarkable. One of them is. A, a cure for an unhealthy person is to drink the urine of a camel. It's in there. Another hadith attributed to the Prophet says, Al-Habba as-Sawda fiha shifa'un min kulli da' illa sab This black seed has cure for every de- disease except death. If that's true, why don't these people who, who, why don't they go to the cancer research centers and all of these and say, well, well, we have a treatment for all of this. You just take this and it's all over. And then finally, an ayah in the Quran says, إِنَّ مِنْ أَزْوَاجِكُمْ وَأَوْلَادِكُمْ عَدُوًا لَكُمْ There are some whose spouses and their children are an enemy of them. It's a fact of life. So what what do you do? If Allah is telling you in your own family you're going to have enemies, what do you do? You turn like a terrorist in your own family? What do you do? You just read the rest of the ayah. فَحْذَرُوهُمْ Be cautious towards them. وَإِن تَعْفُوا وَتَصْفَحُوا وَتَغْفِرُوا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ إِن تَعْفُوا العفو is you forgive someone while you have power and authority over them تَصْفَحُوا you open a new page with them وَتَغْفِرُوا means you forget about the causes of this hostility it's part of the past it's forgotten and forgiven وَتَغْفِرُوا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Now you compare Quranic standards and Quranic values with the behavior of these people who have shamed the Muslims and shamed humanity with the way they are behaving. أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَكُمْ ادعوه سبحانه وأنتم على يقين بالإجابة وتوبوا إلى الله إن الله تواب رحيم
الحمد لله الذي هدى وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا المصطفى وعلى آله وصحبه أولي النهى والتقى Dear committed Muslims In this khutbah as is the, has been the case in many other khutbahs we go into the real world we were just right now visiting the theoretical obstacles that we have been burdened with throughout these centuries and we still carry this burden it's about time we threw this burden off we had fuqaha and ulama and a'imma in those times why don't we have them today we are sterile we no longer can produce thinking minds this person who used to be the ambassador of Saudi Arabia right now he's become the deputy defense minister and who's is the defense minister his brother MBS and this person goes to the front line the borders between Saudi Arabia and Yemen and he make he he states that he will do all he can to further the killing capab these are not his words but this is the meaning to further the killing capabilities of his armed forces and we have a new ambassador in town from that decadent kingdom and she's the daughter of the ambassador who is behind all of this craziness whether it is the political craziness leading up to 9/11 or whether it is the fanatical craziness leading up to these civil wars in muslim countries that's the that's a point man well his daughter now who was 8 years old when we were expelled she used to live here in washington these we she was 8 years old when we began praying here on the street now she's become the new ambassador and then this uh these saudi types the saudi rulers and their political brethren they meet in egypt this past week and then the king of saudi arabia salman he says we assail we are against what iran is doing by launching ballistic missiles against Saudi Arabia and threatening the security of the Red Sea and we want to make this is the king speaking we want to make it clear that our primary and priority issue is the Palestinian issue this person can't talk he made a statement like that he can't think he can't put words together and they want us to believe that he has the capacity those who know him very well know what i'm saying and they want the rest of them they they want to think that we cannot think and so he can make statements like these are words put into his mouth just like they put words into the fuqaha's mouths they put they different levels different people but they put put words into this monarch's mouth They they talk about this deal of the century this Trump and his Yahudi advisors and family members and all of this they have this deal of the century in the making so there his son-in-law and another green blood another Yahudi big wig in this country in the United States incidentally married to an Iranian They are making their rounds in the Middle East, what's called the Middle East, it's the Muslim East. And they are basically going to the Saudis and Emiratis and Omanis and Bahrainis, the rulers there. And they're telling you you're in on this, you have to pay. This is going to cost. It's going to be hundreds of billions of dollars. And who do you think is going to pay for this? They want to sink in 25 billion dollars in the West Bank and Gaza. They want to sink in 40 billion dollars in Egypt. Now these figures can go up and down a little, but this is what they wanted. This is how they want to solve the dislocation of the Palestinian population. The injustice there of generations, they want to solve it with money.
Now there's news about Saudi Arabia permitting the Muslims in Syria who live in areas controlled by the Syrian government to come to Al-Hajj. It's been several years, four or five years now, they were not allowed to go to the Hajj. Now, they're allowed to, and speculation is they're going to reopen, the Saudis are going to reopen their embassy in Damascus. These are called Humat al-Haram, al-Haramayn al-Sharifayn. Shame on us if we stoop to such a low level as to consider them to be the custodians of the two harams when they are in actual fact setting up the destruction of the two harams. This previous ambassador to Washington, ex-foreign minister, now minister of state for foreign affairs, he's still in actual fact is the foreign minister. When he was asked, he was attending a, a conference in Geneva, about U, a UN conference in Geneva on human rights this past week. And when someone asked him about Khashoggi, he, he didn't answer. He just made believe no one asked any question. That's how, that's how guilty they are. And now we have two Saudi Arabian young ladies, we mentioned this last week, they are high and dry in the airport in Hong Kong, been there for months, and they don't, today some decision was supposed to be made whether to send them back to their country or to give them more time in Hong Kong. Why are Muslim women, women running away from home in that kingdom of, the, of this type of rule, these types of rulers? We spoke just right now in the previous khutbah about the unbecoming fiqhi opinion about a person, a man, having the right to get married to someone who is just born. The sad news in Yemen, in this past week, a family was forced to sell their daughter who is only three years old to survive this is this is this is the dichotomy that we are in let me tell you something that happened in one muslim capital during the month of ramadan this this will express the dichotomy i there's more to this i can go on but i just want to sum it up in one one example i have a few other things to say but i'm just going to cut it short so that you will understand. This is what I'm trying to say. In one Muslim capital, in the month of Ramadan, a person goes up to the employee, the official, unofficial, who is at a certain desk in one of the ministries. He goes up there and he says, I need this paperwork done and please expedite it for me. And over there, that means you know, someone's asking you to expedite something, to do it a little more quickly than usual. They expect you to pay them for doing that. So this is an unwritten law. So the person, this is the, in the month of Ramadan. So the person goes to his pocket and hands the employee a bribe. That's what it is. It's a bribe. So the employee in the month of Ramadan, both of them fasting, takes the bribe. And then he said, of course, I'll expedite this for you, no problem. So the person, the Muslim, in the month of Ramadan, fasting, has a, let's call it a candy bar, in his pocket. He takes it out and gives it to the employee. The employee says, sorry, I'm fasting. In his, under, in his understanding, taking some chocolate in the month of Ramadan is going to violate his fast. But taking a bribe, that was all right. There's no violation of the fast there. This is the contradiction that we are living. 
اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه ولا تجعله ملتبسا علينا واجعلنا للمتقين إماما ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إصرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين ربنا صل وسلم وبارك على محمد وآل محمد وصل وسلم وبارك على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر ومن أظلم ممن منع مساجد الله أن يذكر فيها اسمه وسعى في خرابها أولئك ما كان لهم أن يدخلوها إلا خائفين لهم في الدنيا خزي ولهم في الآخرة عذاب عظيم وأقم الصلاة